Andre, thank you so much for inviting me. And I, I want to shout out, give a shout out to Shreyas who helped contribute to the slides for this talk, and also to David Larson who asked the questions that allowed this um, allowed this talk to come together. So, in the course of the next 25 minutes, my goal is to answer a, a few questions for you um, about COVID-19 in a way that's relevant to us as radiologists and um, in the radiology department. Um, first of all, how is the disease transmitted? Um, can we reuse masks and PPE? Um, how does surgical masks compare to respirators? Can we be carrying or transmitting the disease without knowing it? And what can we do to prevent the spread of disease? And over the weekend, I did a pretty deep dive on the literature to help answer these questions. I did send the slides to Andre so um, he can distribute these to you if you would like to look at the primary references yourself. They're actually very good to read. So first question, um, course of the disease and who is at risk of contracting COVID? What we do know from the literature is that from a known contact, there's a median of 5.1 days to um, the start of symptoms, and 99% of individuals will develop symptoms within 14 days of being exposed to COVID. What we don't know is the latent period, which is um, how long these individuals may be infectious before they develop symptoms. Um, other papers suggest that that may be one to two days before symptoms develop. In a population of hospitalized patients, meaning people who had illness severe enough to require hospitalization, the most common symptoms were fever, fatigue, and dry cough. If you look at the list of symptoms here, um, which include myalgia, dyspnea, et cetera, you can see that they're not specific to COVID. Unfortunately, um, they're common to many URIs. What we know is that um, from the time from the first symptom to developing shortness of breath, is a median of five days. And from then onward, there's pretty rapid progression from the time of first symptom to developing ARDS has a median of eight days. In terms of distribution of symptoms, 81% of individuals who develop COVID will have a mild disease, meaning no pneumonia or mild pneumonia. 14% will have severe disease, typically what would require hospitalization, such as shortness of breath, tachypnea, low oxygen saturation in the blood, or um, lung infiltrates involving over half the lung within one to two days. 5% will have critical disease, which means respiratory or other organ failure or septic shock, and unfortunately, half of those people with critical disease will die of the disease. Last update on Monday, the case fatality rate within the United States is 1.27%. And you can see on the chart on the right where we stand relative to other countries. The case fatality rate by country is dictated by a number of factors, including the age of the tested population and older population will be expected to have a higher case fatality rate. The severity of the illness in the tested population, comorbidities in the tested population, and also the resources a country has to treat the severely ill. So if a country runs out of resources, such as in Italy where they have a shortage of respirators, then you would expect a higher case fatality rate. Of the people in the United States who died of COVID, um, we know that the majority are um, the elderly being defined as 65 or older, but one in five of the fatalities in the United States have occurred in individuals in the 20 to 64 year age range. Risk factors that elevate one's, uh, the case fatality rate, um, the, high, the greatest risk factors are um, advanced age and cardiovascular disease. Other risk factors include diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and cancer. A question that a lot of us have is, if once you develop COVID, are you immune to it? And unfortunately, we don't have that answer yet. The answer is just not known. What we do know from cold viruses, which are 15% uh, of those are coronaviruses, is that they can create immune responses, but for, for those more benign diseases, that immune response is not durable. And so you can get reinfected with the same cold virus repeatedly, and some cold viruses have been in the circulation um, for decades. We also know that, that COVID does create an antibody immune response. All patients who developed COVID did develop antibodies by 39 days in one unpublished study. And we also, um, but we don't know how long that immune response will last and how protective that will be. In terms of infectivity, there was a study that looked at viral shedding in patients who were ill enough to be hospitalized for COVID. They looked at 191 inpatients with known outcomes, either discharge or death. 
And what they found was that in the people who survived, the median duration of viral shedding was 20 days, which is a really long time, three weeks. Uh, for the people who died, the median duration of viral shedding was actually longer and lasted until the time of patient death. The shortest was eight days. The longest in this study was 37 days of respiratory viral shedding. From um, This was measured by throat swabs. And as you can see on the graphic below, the median duration of viral shedding actually was um, longer than the median duration of the symptoms that they studied, including fever, cough, and dyspnea. We also know that um, some patients carry the vir virus in their feces, and the duration of fecal shedding of virus actually exceeds the duration of shedding in the respiratory tract. In this paper, they found that the mean duration of fecal shedding was 28 days after symptom onset, meaning that the mean, uh, po the mean positive um, fecal tests lasted for 11.2 days after the patient had a negative respiratory sample. The longest was 33 days after a patient had a negative respiratory sample. What that means is that in addition to respiratory, feces are a potential source of transmission by symptomatic, previously symptomatic, or asymptomatic carriers. This is just a chart. The um, bars in red are the duration of respiratory shedding, and the bars in orange are the duration of positive fecal tests. So, how do we think the disease is transmitted? We don't have a lot. We don't have any direct evidence, unfortunately, because it's so new of COVID. But we can extrapolate from influenza data. And what we know from flu and other upper respiratory illnesses is, is the main mechanism of transmission is person to person by respiratory droplets within six feet. That's why we have the six foot rule for social distancing. Con um, we can also transmit by contact with contaminated surfaces, usually to the hand, which then if it touches the mucous membranes um, will cause transmission. So imagine everyone around you has a six foot vapor cloud of potential transmissibility. Why do we know six feet? There was a study of flu patients inpatients and ED patients in which they actually sampled the air around these patients and found flu particles up to a distance of six feet around the patient. We do know that smaller air particles, such as the ones um, expelled by just passive breathing, can stay airborne longer, and up to 89% of the flu-carrying particles were in these small particles less than 4.7 microns in diameter. We also know that coughing or sneezing can expel particles farther than six feet away. A real-world um, study of COVID spread looked at three negative pressure rooms that housed COVID patients in China. And what they found was that before the room was cleaned, 13 of the 15 um, sites that were tested had virus, including non-obvious locations like the windows, and also three of five bathroom sites tested positive. After cleaning, all sites tested negative, which indicates the importance of good cleaning in this disease. We also, also fortunately, the PPE samples of physicians who walked in and out of the room tested negative except for one shoe front, which did not seem to track because the entryway tested negative. The presence of virus on air vents in these rooms does suggest that some of the virus is airborne, and it may be that the air samples that were independently tested in the room were negative because the virus was aggressively removed by the negative pressure. We also know that COVID-19 lasts a really long time on surfaces. It lasts up to three days on stainless steel, three days on plastic, 24 hours on cardboard, and at least three hours in aerosolized form. Here's the graphic from the paper that studied this, and you can see the, um, the decay and viability of the virus on the logarithmic scale. The red is COVID and the blue is SARS, and the two are quite similar, except that SARS does not persist on cardboard as long as COVID does. And the three hours for the aerosol, um, that was just the time when they stopped um, studying. And so it could actually potentially push, persist longer than three hours. In fact, what we do know from the Diamond Princess cruise ship is that COVID-19 lasted for up to 17 days in the cabins of both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients who were proven to be infected. And unfortunately, because it is so persistent, viruses do spread very quickly through a work, the workspace. There was a study um, published in 2019 in which they used a benign bacteriophage tracer 
painted on one subject's hand and also painted on a single doorknob in the morning. And then they tested surfaces within the office at 2.30 in the afternoon. They did two additional iterations, one with disinfection of surfaces once during the day and one with disinfection plus providing a hand hygiene bundle to the office workers. And what did they find? What they found was that all 68 surfaces tested positive by 2.30 p.m. And this included areas like the break room, the coffee pot handle, the candy jar, doorknobs, the restroom, communal refrigerator. They all tested positive. That's the white bar on this graphic. After a single midday disinfection, the high touch surface area concentrations were reduced by 42%. And when hand hygiene was added to that, the concentrations were reduced by 85% showing them, again, the importance of cleaning and hand hygiene. Unfortunately, we can't rely on, the, on, on hospital housekeeping to keep us safe either. Even, even the best ones, unfortunately, there's a heterogeneity in the amount of cleanliness in the hospital. This study looked at the best housekeepers that this um, hospital had. The housekeepers knew they were being studied, and the investigators looked at um, high-touch areas using, using bioluminescent ATP to look at the to see how well um, the housekeepers had cleaned. And they, as you can see, the higher the, the bars on this graph, the worse. And you can see that within an individual housekeeper and between housekeepers, there is great variability in the cleanliness that was achieved. And with all this contamination, um, we are at risk because it's very, very hard to avoid touching the face. There's a study of 26 medical students, all of who had infection control education, so they knew not to touch their faces. They were observed in the study, and it was found that they touched their faces an average of 23 times per hour. Almost half of those times were directly to their mucosal membranes, which again is a source of transmission of viral disease. Even with a respirator or mask on, it's hard to avoid touching the face. A study of 10 ICU nurses who were given N95s to be worn for the duration of a 12-hour shift showed that on average, these nurses touch their faces um, 25 times per 12-hour shift. Most commonly, they were touching or adjusting their N95s, but it didn't matter. As long as they touched their face, they, were, they could risk transferring the virus to their mucous membranes. So as, as much as we are concerned about masks or respirators, they, are, they will only protect you if you don't touch your face. And it is really, really important to not touch your face. It's hard to do. So next question, might my coworkers, my patients, or I have the disease without me knowing it? And the answer is an absolute yes. There was data on the Diamond Princess cruise ship. We actually got updated data just um, a couple of days ago, which showed that half the patients at the time of, um, half the passengers and crew at the time of testing were asymptomatic for the disease. Many did eventually develop symptoms, so ultimately 18% of those individuals remained asymptomatic but were in fact testing positive for COVID. We think that 18% may be an underestimate for a general population because the population of a cruise ship tended to be older and they tested symptomatic people before asymptomatic people, so there may be more than 18% asymptomatic rate in our general population. We also know that from German evacuees from China that asymptomatic people can test positive, and we also know that there was a study that modeled the spread of infection in China, and they found that the only way to explain how rapidly the disease spread in China prior to January travel restrictions was that 86% of the infections that were occurring in China were not documented officially, meaning people, did not, people didn't know that they had COVID, but they were spreading the disease. We also know that um, even testing for COVID is not entirely sensitive. There's a paper, um, again, from, the, from patients in China that shows that nasal swabs in that study were 63% positive, and this is through PCR. And we know that there are different PCR tests with different targets, but we do know that, in fact, um, this PCR testing is not entirely sensitive. The CDC and the um, FDA websites say as much and say you need to pair that with clinical assessment. So knowing that, and knowing that um, we have a serious shortage of masks and PPE, that raises the question of can I reuse or when can I reuse masks or PPE? And I would suggest that you go to the CDC website, which does offer substantial guidance on how to reuse um, or, or extend use of masks or PPE. They do say it is a last resort meant to conserve supply. And before doing that, they would recommend first just minimizing the number of people who even need to use respiratory protection using um, process controls. If you do have to end up re reuse your mask or N95, 
they say that to protect the surface of it with a cleanable face shield, because if you do get contamination of the surface, then you can no longer reuse it. They also would suggest re avoiding repeat donning and doffing, because um, that would each time you don and doff would risk contaminating the mask. We also know that unless we are performing aerosolizing procedures, we have been asked to wear surgical masks and not N95s even when uh, managing COVID positive patients. So how do surgical masks compare to N95s? There was a good randomized control trial that was published in JAMA in 2019 that shows that actually in real world settings, they offer equal protection against upper respiratory infection. Again, extrapolating against flu and other upper respiratory illnesses, um, this, this was a um, the study covered four years, 12, uh, during four years of 12 weeks of peak viral respiratory illness, and they found that between the providers who wore N95s and those who wore medical masks, there was no difference in lab-confirmed influenza in those groups, despite the fact that um, they were exposed to the same percentage of patients who had documented illness and also to the same percentage of family members with documented illness. Specifically against COVID, we do know that there was a single patient who exposed 41 healthcare workers to um, during aerosolizing procedures. 85% were wearing surgical masks and 15% were wearing N95s, and neither group of providers tested positive or developed symptoms. This was in Singapore, so in addition to wearing masks, they really emphasized that they exercised good hand hygiene and followed other standard procedures to avoid transmission. So, um, and thanks to Shreyas for this slide, are radiology personnel at risk for contracting and spreading the disease? The answer is um, yes. Um, and we do know that the secondary symptomatic attack rate, meaning if you are exposed um, as a close contact to a symptomatic individual, um, the likelihood that you will um, catch uh, COVID from that symptomatic individual is 0.45%. It's higher if it's a household member, 10%. If someone is asymptomatic and uh, carries COVID, we do not know the transmission rate for that. And the definition of close contact is variable, um, but what it does mean is prolonged exposure for greater than a few minutes. And by um, contact, and um, there, there were, was literature on contact tracing that suggests that more extensive contact than even a few minutes would be required to um, transmit COVID. With the, C the CDC defines close contact close contact is sitting within six feet in a waiting area or direct contact with secretions or touching bare hands of an ill patient or being coughed on. Factors that affect transmission. Basically, um, it's the, the more the exposure, whether you have direct contact, whether you're being, you're protected with PPE, whether you're exposed to aerosols, whether you touch your face, all would increase um, your risk of, tra of, of transmitting or um, or catching COVID, and um, how, how might radiology be unintentionally spreading the disease between patients? So what, what might we be doing that could unintentionally spread? Well, if we are early asymptomatic carriers or if patients are early asymptomatic carriers, there could be transmission. With portable exams, um, with mo moving of equipment, with individuals passing by um, people in the hall, there is also potentially a risk of transmission. So again, minimal co minimizing contact and good sanitation and hygiene is key. Um, and this is, and, and also equipment surfaces, as we knew from the um, literature that we cited, that um, the virus stays a long time on surfaces. So it's really important to clean all surfaces, including non-obvious things like light switches, door handles, handrails, because we do know that after cleaning, um, that cleaning is very effective on viruses. The likely mechanism of spread droplets, surfaces, including, and this is important to all of us, keyboards, mouse, monitors and door handles. And how will we know if we're spreading the disease? Unfortunately, um, there's no good measure for whether we are individually spreading the disease. And down the road, we could probably look back in EPIC and maybe figure, figure that out. But the only way to really know that we're not spreading the disease is to have very firm process-based um, measures that are practical that we adhere to to ensure that we do not spread the disease. And as you can see, if, if one symptomatic person with one close encounter can, has a 0.45% chance of spreading the disease, with 25 close contacts, that goes up to over 10% risk of, of um, 
passing the disease along. So what prevention strategies are considered to be effective? If you haven't already done so, I would suggest that you read this great article in The New Yorker um, by Atul Gawande. You can just search for the title of this. It's free. Um, he really synthesized well the lessons learned from Singapore and Hong Kong, both of which had both both of which had gone through the SARS epidemic. They learned what they quote unquote called the bitter lessons of SARS and hence apply, were able to apply those when COVID arrived in their countries. And the key tactics was the routine use of personal protection. Um, frequent disinfection was key and they disinfected every surface between every patient consult. It did not matter if the patient had COVID diagnosed or not. Also, they, were, um, they grouped patients by risk to minimize transmission between patient populations, and they made sure that everyone adhered to social distancing between patients, between visitors, between staff, between staff and patient to the best extent possible. So in summary, um, COVID-19, as you can see, is very contagious. It stays on surfaces for a long time. It shows up in respiratory secretions. It shows up, it can show up as fecal contamination. It, um, that makes cleaning processes much more important. We need to be more consistently excellent. We need to disinfect frequently. We need to have special teams to really make sure that we're cleaning properly and meticulous hand hygiene. If you touch something that you don't, didn't recently clean, you should assume that your hand's contaminated. This is true at work. This is as true outside of work. And don't touch your face, which is a really hard thing to do, but if you touch, but you really need to not touch your face, even if you have a mask on to keep yourself safe. 